Mick Blood, it's Dennis Gray. How are you? Good day, mate. You know, I say this often, but it's very true that when my brother and I started planning this podcast, we drew up a list of names of musicians we wanted to get on the show, guys and girls who we think younger rock fans should be aware of, and your name was one of the first we jotted down, so it's very cool that we chat today. Yeah, thanks. Now, we kicked off uh, this show, Mick, with, dare I say, the Lime Spider's signature tune, Slave Girl from 1984. Released on Citadel Records, the number one independent single in Australia for 1984. What are your memories of writing that? And it was the number one, the number one independent single of all time, actually. I didn't know that. Really, all time. The, the biggest selling um, independent of all time. It um, eclipsed all records and was in the top twenty for about three years or something ridiculous. It was number one for God knows how long. You know, it's um, an absolute monster. You know, when you pen Slave Girl. Um, you know, were you were you aware that you were creating a song that would go on to become, you know, an icon of Australian underground rock and roll? Well, not just Australian. It, it put us on the map worldwide, actually. Like, and it was only our second single, and it, it came without um, any fuss or bother. It just just released to an independent label and um, without a film clip even. So, um, I was just glad that it was released um, because at the point where John called us out of the blue we got, uh, with his interest connection, Citadel, John Needham. Mm. Um, I'd approached three labels, the three hippest labels in Sydney at the time, um, Waterfront, Hot and um, Phantom, who weren't interested. So they saw the source on the foot. <laughs> they, mm-hmm. they knocked it back um, for whatever reason. So I was pretty disappointed about the whole thing and ready to give the game away just about because so I was convinced it was I was sitting on some dynamite there and I was right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Slave Girl was covered by the Goo Goo Dolls in the mid nineties on their album A Boy Named Goo. Um, you've obviously heard that. What are your thoughts on their interpretation there, Mick? I liked their um, version actually. It was, it was so well spirited. Um, interestingly enough, there's a live version. They released a live version of it um, from Red Rocks on their best of, or volume two best of compilation mm-hmm. back in, uh, in the, I don't know, 2000, what, mm-hmm. 2000 or something. And they used three guitars to, to cover it. <laughs> <laughs> you Which, didn't um, need that. We just needed um, Jacko, uh, who was a genius in his day, and I started the band with him, you know. I'd, Took him under my wing when he was, you know, very young, and um, he went on to play with um, the New Christ and the Hitman before he was twenty. You know, like um, he became a hired gun before he was twenty. You know, so it was great to see my little buddy. You know, as much as I hated him leaving the band, and would love mm. to have done more work with him, um, I was really proud that he um, got his stripes in rock and roll, and yeah, it became um, as uh, as renowned as he, as, he, as he should have been. You know, he was absolutely genius, you know. Well, besides digging into some of your history, the purpose of getting on the show is to make people aware of a couple of big shows coming up, one local and one also in Spain. Saturday the 2nd of December at the Marrickville Bowling Club in Sydney. Tickets for that show are available online through Austix. And after that gig, you're hot-footing it over to Leon in Spain where the band are playing the Purple Festival, which runs from the 6th to the 9th of December. Purpleweekend.com is the place to visit for more info. Must be good to hit an overseas stage again, mate. Yeah, I've got no idea why it's called the Purple Weekend. It's um, <laughs> over, four, is that over four days and only one of those days is on a weekend. <laughs> um, there's Spanish logic for you or something, you know. Yeah, of course, it's um, an absolute honour. We're actually headlining it. Um, us and Red Cross are the two headline acts, so it's it's um, quite a big it's a big comeback for us. I mean, it, I hate I hate the word comeback. Um, I'm, I'm I prefer the word um, a rebirth. Actually, <laughs> it's the way you look at it. It's a big it's a big comeback, and certainly a big personal comeback for me. It's been a long personal journey to get back to. Being healthy enough to do anything, much less rock again, you know. Mm-hmm. How is your health these days? Uh, well, I mean, do you know the story? Do you know sure, anything about sure. what I've been through? Sure, I do. Would, did you want to uh, briefly let some of our listeners know what you've been through? Well, I would. I would, actually, because it, it's, it's, it's a good personal story of um, 
well, for anybody who's ever suffered a brain injury, like I was assaulted three and a half years ago in 2014, and um, I was, you know, it was a near-death assault. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of one-punch attacks that get the um, get a lot of publicity for good reasons, um, you know, for bad reasons, and um, but unfortunately, there's people, a lot of people like myself who survive these um, cowardly attacks and um, have to deal with the ramifications, you know. Um, and there's some ongoing side effects, you know, that I have to deal with, you know. Um, mm. Largely, um, short-term memory loss is a big one. I'm going to be a bit of a worry overseas. You know, the guys want to put, you know, put a tracking device on me, I think, so they don't lose me. <laughs> <laughs> it's that sort of thing, you know. I, sure. Um, I can find crowds a bit overwhelming, so all ends up this festival thing is going to be not going to be easy for me on a personal mm. level, but it's going to be wonderful feeling, um, you know, performing on that stage because uh, those Spanish fans just love us. I've known it, I've known this for like over thirty years. Mm. We've just had a massive following over there, you know, for eons and. Um, they're just absolute fanatics about the band. So, you know, we, um, I'm sure it's going to be an amazing atmosphere. <laughs> so it's a, it's a massive personal accomplishment to, um, to be playing these two shows. Well, it is, you know, uh, beyond the, um, beyond the, um, brain injury you acquired from, acquired from this assault, mm. 80 months later, as, 80 months later as a bonus, I, um, I sustained prostate cancer, you know, mm. And mm. had to have my prostate removed, so um, that didn't really help with my <laughs> recovery from a brain injury. So, mm. Mm. and as a consequence, I suffered, you know, major depression, and um, I just didn't want to live anymore. I had enough. I had enough of everything. You know? mm. I just mm. didn't want. I did not want to be alive. Um, so I reached rock bottom, and I won't go into the gory details, but it was awful. You know, like. I just um, lost all, you know, I was completely lost and um, didn't have any um, or any incentive to continue. Um, mm. And when you've been there, uh, like I have, getting back to the point I'm at now is, um, well, it's wonderful because, you know, you really cherish every day, you know, you really, you know, every, every day... I've been, well, I've been working so hard. I mean, I'm actually managing the band. So I've been working very hard on emotional stuff and just all year I've been working um, pretty tirelessly on, on everything towards uh, these gigs. And so, you know, just attention to detail, not leaving any stone unturned and, you know, make sure when I get, make sure I get it right, you know, like, um, cause it's not just, it's not just another line of spiders gig. It's not just a reformation that, that's the point I'm making. It's it's a very important um, personal thing, you know. I've got a lot of bands reformed for the sake of it, but we're, we're certainly not doing that, you know. This is we mean business, and it sounds like we mean business. I can assure you, <laughs> band Did, sounding um, great. We we had our first lot of rehearsals, first lot of rehearsals the other week, and the and the, and, um, the band sounding better than ever. Really, um, really good lineup and some great new songs we're doing. Can I ask if, on a personal level, did rock and roll, uh, it must have played some part in, in getting you back up? Uh, you know, I mean, rock and roll, it's a cliche, but it does get us through so many things. If you are passionate about music, did it play a part in, in where you are today? Uh, yeah, there was a yeah, there was a real turning point. Um, and people need to know about this, actually, because it's, um, well, it's personal, but, it was made pretty public because my own band, what, when I was down and out, at, at, you know, when I was really at my lowest bed, um, and I'd just been diagnosed with prostate cancer, um, those um, bleep, bleep, bleeps decided to um, continue the band without me. Without, you know, I formed the band in, in 1979. <laughs> Hello. Um, it was my baby. My, you know, uh, it was me that got got these guys in the band and overseas and recording albums and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And their way out was to replace me. But they, 
you know, decided they wanted to replace me. Um, well, they actually um, rehearsed a singer and um, who, you know, is a friend of mine, which had, had an insult injury and mm-hmm. um, had a gig booked, a, a profile gig booked um, with a profile lineup, etc. And um, I first I knew about it was um, through my nephew. And um, once I found out about it, to cut a long story short, I I got very angry, and um, the next very next morning, I, I contacted the um, uh, the loser involved in in trying to promote it, and mm. uh, gave him he said, you know, gave him what for time. Mm. In no circumstances, I told him exactly what I thought of, what he was attempting to achieve. Explain the um, legalities involved and how much and how hurt I was about it, etc. Anyway, he put a stop to it within a couple of hours, luckily, because people would have boycotted it, you know, mm-hmm. on my behalf. Um, people would have boycotted it. Um, but that sort of that episode kind of um, kind of uh, lit those burning embers that were yeah, in my soul somewhere, you know, like okay. there was some. Burning, burning rock embers there that um, were ignited by that, and I think it was a real turning point. I got so angry about it, I decided that, um, well, you know, I'm going to do it again, and I'm not going to do it without you guys. You know, mm-hmm. um, it was, you know, that was the promise I made to myself, and now I am. You know, so more power to me. <laughs> Absolutely. So. Um... The gig in Spain, uh, are there any club gigs in Spain planned to coincide with that festival date? No, because um, the contract deal was um, exclu- exclusivity, <laughs> exclusivity for a year. Like we, weren't, we couldn't play in Spain anywhere else in Spain this year. Okay. Like um, that was uh, part of the um, contract we just showed off. You know, they, Fair enough. You know, so what can you tell us about the current lineup besides yourself and longtime Lime Spider Phil Hall? You've got Dave Sparks on guitar and Andrew Nunn's on the drum kit, right? Yeah. Well, Dave's been a um, long-time Lime Spider as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, he first joined the band in 97, so he's been with me for 20 years, I don't know, and played in our live album. And um, so we, you know, um, get back a long way and... Um, Done, done a lot of, you know, work. Done, done a lot of big gigs together and so on. Yeah. Andrew's near to the, near to the club, and um, the cute story there is that um, like he's had a new drummer, and when he when he was seventeen, when he was a real, a real youngster, he was our biggest fan in Melbourne. Um, whenever we went there or anywhere in Victoria for that matter, he'd always beat the gigs and was just really influenced by Richard Lawson's drumming yeah. and was. Um, we got to know him really well back then because he was just mm. always always at our gigs and um that's going back to late eighties, early nineties. And um all those years down the track, he's kept drumming in various bands he's been in over the years and he was drumming back then, he started when he was about fourteen or something. Mm-hmm. Um and he's been in the underground lovers and um uh various other things. Um he's kept his hand in and I think he teaches drums as well. And anyway, all these years on the track, he's um, he's he's playing in our band. He's playing in the in the very band that was such a big influence on him, you know. Um, so it's a real um, it's cool. It's a nice little happens. yeah, it's a nice little story in itself, you know. It's a it's a, yeah, it's pretty cute, really. Okay, mate, let me hit you with a couple of general questions. Uh, what was the first record you bought? Single or album? Album. Oh, album. First. Album I bought was um, first two albums I bought were Beatles Abbey Road and Cosmos Factory Creedence Cosmos Factory when I was about mm. you know eleven or twelve you know mm. so I had pretty good taste from the start you did and, and from memory that record had like four or five big singles off it didn't it uh, Traveling Band Up Around the Bend uh, yeah Help Me Out Who'll Stop the Rain they're they're all on there Long As I Can See the Light yeah it's it's, it's somewhat it's one of the one of the greatest albums of all time, you know, like um and you know 
everything I bought in those days, like even you know early singles and stuff I bought in those days, I still love them. You know, they were, you know, it's not like they've, I've grown, I've grown away from those things. You know, like mm. my taste is, you know, um, nothing I've bought over the years I've ever really grown apart from. You know, like mm. I still love what I loved then. I still love now. You know, like. Um, I'm not really so much into musical fads. I've never been into that type of thing, you know. Things that come and go, you know, like, oh, I just like songs that stand the test of time, basically, you know. Yeah, Getting back to my 60s pop roots, you know, like, um, you know, there's not much 60s pop stuff, um, man, woman, or beast that I don't know about, you know. So what, uh, what are some of the bands you were seeing growing up? You grew up around St Mary's Way in Sydney's West? Oh, in St Mary's, yeah, not in around, Mary's, yeah. Okay. Well, there, there wasn't um, there wasn't a music scene at all when I grew up. I mean, my first exposure to live music was my oldest my older brother's band, and this is documented in my book. Um, they called the they called the High Riders, and um, you know, I clearly remember um, going to rehearsal at my primary school um, on a Saturday afternoon and sitting in with the band and being so excited to be sitting right there with a live band, you know, including my brother and his mm. mates I got to know and they were really polished outfit, you know, like, um, in fact, they went on to, back in those days, um, New Faces and Holden Showcase were two um, television, two major television um, talent quests. They made, the, they made the final of both those in mm. days when it's unheard of that bands would make um, make the grade at, in those in those kind of contests. You know, like it was really slick sort of stuff that was doing it. But my brother's band were very much like the uh, the Turtles and you know that sort of ha- on the mm. bit of Beatles influence, a lot of great harmonies and stuff. So yeah, that was a very early influence. You know, like um, but uh, I had a pretty sheltered upbringing as far as live music was concerned, but I certainly had certainly had some good friends with a lot of uh, great records, you know, so the, the record club was um, pretty big amongst, and we had good local record store where the, um, back in the days when there was actual service and mm-hmm. um, Jeff's record bar it was called, and um, good old Jeff would always, um, once he got to know what I was into, he just nurtured my taste with... Um, putting things aside so when I walked in he'd play me things that uh, I normally liked and normally mm. bought you know like and that's the way it used to be you know that's how I'm so impersonalised these days compared it to is, that you know is, like it is. you know you got JB Hi-Fi and these are the corporate you know uh, giants that, um, that sort of thing I'm talking about has gone out the window years ago you know well mate not enough time in this episode to look over your musical history in fine detail. There's a lot of rock and roll ground to cover, but I have selected a few that's highlights. Why that's, which... why I'm, that's, that's why I'm writing a book. That's why I'm writing a book about it because um, there is a lot to tell, and it's it's you know it's a 37 year career. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've just updated our bio, and that, the amount of achievements we've made over the years, um, it was really quite difficult to summarise it all. But I got it down to a thousand words exactly, actually. So. Well, I've, um, a I've, just chosen, worth. I've chosen a few, and, and if you've got, um, I'll just get you to elaborate on a couple, please. So, story yeah. goes, the original Lime Spiders outfit formed from seeing each other regularly at the gigs of Sydney Outfit, The Lonely Hearts. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We were all, um, this was based out of Liverpool, in the western side of Sydney, and um, yeah, we all got to know each other through that, because that band had a, they were very much a power pop band that, had a really unique, uh, well, it was unique in, in the fact that they had a really um, mm. world following of, of crew that would I'd go to all their gigs, and um, I was one of them, and um, it was also their first ever roadie, or one of their first roadies, where I learnt um, some basics of that, sort of, of, the, of the mechanics of it all. The great thing was we all knew each other, and um, it was just an incredible atmosphere. You go to a gig, no matter where, you, where it was, you go on your own, on your own, and know that you'd run into a million people. You knew, you know, have a have a ball. I mean, and out of that, uh, we all, you know, met each other through that 
the original members, and um, yes, that was the um, starting point. And in fact, our first ever gig with Eric Groves on guitar, I might add, the guru himself, <laughs> um, Parramatta's rugby league winger and Australia, mm. uh, he played our first ever show supporting the Lonely Hearts at the Railway Hotel at Liverpool, actually. <laughs> like, um, Christmas Eve, 79? No, I, that, that was originally what, what I thought it was. But I since writing this book, I've had to do a, a lot of research. And mm, mm. I know more about the band now than I ever did. So it was actually November 23rd, 79 it was. So, um, yeah, it's funny because writing the book, I've just, <laughs> as I say, I've, I, I'm, I know more about my own band now than I ever did. <laughs> So you mentioned Eric Growth there, and I guess a lot of people are familiar with that story that, you know, in the band's early days, you know, and he was a notable rugby league player. So he, he was just one of those fans who you'd met showing up at the Lonely Hearts gigs, correct? No, no. I was um, getting together with Daryl Mather on a regular basis, just playing records, mainly the Pebbles and Nuggets sort of stuff mm. that was really um, lighting a fuse with all that obscure 60s psychedelia and, and 60s punk stuff. Um, and Lonely Hearts wanted us, well, offered us um, a, this gig. We didn't have a band as such, you know, but um, I didn't know Eric, and he wasn't one of that crew, but um, Darren knew him and um, knew he played guitar and and got on the blower to him, and uh, he was in within five minutes, and uh, mm. that's how that our first line was um, formed like that just over the phone, a couple of phone calls, and you're in, you know? <laughs> well, I recall um, he... he very ad hoc. Uh, back then, they used to have those footy talent shows on TV, and I know that he was... I remember watching mm. him with an acoustic guitar perform on that back in the day. Oh, yeah, he's... Um, he's a damn fine guitarist, actually. Like, he had the same problem as his... He, ironically, his son, Eric Jr., was a was was a bass player in a pretty prominent band. Um, oh, I forgot forgot what the name was, but they I think in the nineties there he they were actually you know had a profile on the going places and he actually gave up rugby league. He would played Origin and so on and had a successful career, but he gave up um, rugby league because you know for his music. Whereas Eric Senior, his dad, had given up. Um, music for rugby league, you know, like um, it was the other way around. But they both had a juggling act between music and and their um, football dreams. Mm. Uh, but Eric Eric Senior, old um, old guru, I recently did a few songs with his. He's got a band called Eric and the Gurus, Eric Grace and the Gurus, and they did a Harbour Cruise in Sydney um, back in July. And I went down for it and uh, got up for a couple of songs. Uh, and that was a lot of fun. Was, um, yeah, he's got back got right back into his music now. He's, fin- he's finally finished. He, he, was, he was a coach for quite a few years after his playing days. And um, now he's just um, getting back into his music with a few mates for a bit of fun and, you know, mm-hmm. enjoying it. So had you performed or sung in high school? And I guess I'm asking that because... I mean, at what stage did you know that you had maybe a distinctive rock voice? I always had a song in my head growing up. You know, I was, um, I was brought up in, in the 60s with, with so many great melodic 60s songs um, mm. running through my head. And I um, used to do a lot of fishing on my own. And, um, you know, I always had a song in my head and um, um, never really knew... I could sing, but I wasn't shy about it. I, I mm. liked, I enjoyed singing, you know, and um, my first performance, or technically my first performance was to the to the Pacific Ocean <laughs> when I walked out. Um, oh, I was about probably eight or thereabouts. Okay. Um, I put my, my great Auntie Ivy's at Blue Bay on the Central Coast going fishing one day and there was a big rock platform near her place and I walked out and it was very tired. I walked out that was my that was my stage. I walked out to the end of the rock platform and um, I sung yesterday loud and proud, you know, to the yeah. ocean and uh, made sure there was no one else around, of course. But yeah. um, once I realised that, I uh, let, let fly and um, really enjoyed it. And I remember it clearly. Um, 
It's documented in my book, you know. It's a little anecdote of in my book. Because it's a cool story. Was, yeah, it's it's kind of pretty cute, and um, it's um, yeah, it was. Um, I guess I um, I knew then that I could sing. I never had any coaching or anything like a lot of rock singers, but um, mm. I think the music was in our blood. I mean, literally. I mean, you know, with the, with the name. Um, sure. My father was a, um, a tenor. And both my older brothers sung in bands. So every male in our immediate family has been a singer, you know. So that's that's the lineage, you know. It is interesting. It's definitely got to be something in the genes there, you know. And maybe you've just named the title of your book if you haven't got it. You had uh, Music's in the Blood, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) Well... You, you stick to being a journey. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, well, many of our loyal listeners will be familiar with your history, but for those unaware, in 1982, the band win a Battle of the Bands competition at Sydney Southern Cross Hotel with the winner getting money to record a single. How do you look back on that very first EP, the four-track double single, 25th Hour? Well, the um, amazing thing, the way it panned out was, uh, I mean, the whole, everything about it was um, pretty amazing. That competition was run over four months with 60, 64 bands over four months, mm. four bands every Sunday afternoon, you know, like in a pretty high standard mm. in Sydney at that stage, you know, like um, like a very high standard actually. Sydney back in those days was just um, brimming with immense talent on every corner, you know, there was a lot mm. of a lot of good stuff going on. So, I mean, to win it was quite, was, was an achievement in itself and then before I knew it, we're recording. Um, the, the prize for it was recording the the, um, the recording deal with Green Records, um, Roger Creason and Stuart Keep's label. Mm. But um, half the band or ha- half the people involved was really a Birdman. Like Rob Young sure. was behind the controls, producing it, and Warwick Gilbert was in the band. The way it panned out, Warwick played bass on it. This after we won the competition that night. Uh, David Guest, our bass player, who was very rudimentary, um, but you know got 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 away with it. <laughs> mm. And um, he he just said to me, Mick, he, he just said, "Well, you know, get yourself a decent bass player for the recording, Mick." You know, which was very very nice of him. Um, you know, so that's how we come about. Uh, Daryl knew, um, or Jim Wiley actually, our our, uh, our, our artist. Uh, at the time, in the early days, Dilly departed. Jim Wiley was an animator. He used to work for Hanna Barbera with um, Warwick Gilbert. So that was a connection there um, from the an- the animation side of things. Because Warwick was also a very talented animator, which in- and responsible for a lot of um, Birdman's artwork, with, if not all of it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, he ended up playing bass on our record, you know. It still sounds so damn raw. I love it. I guess many fans regard it as uh, some of the band's best work. Oh, yeah. Love your early stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the thing is, like, you know, we did, we've done five albums, you know, three studio albums, one live album, and a best of compilation. And um, really, I mean, you know, a lot of people that think they know the band haven't even really listened. I haven't really listened to those albums a great deal, I think. The first album got a bit of notoriety, but. Our third album, By Heaven's Fist, sunk without a trace for various reasons, which is a shame because it was by far the best thing we've done. You know, so I well, get a bit I, sick of I'm hearing gonna, about I'm the audience. I'm going to talk about that because it's. Uh, I think Beethoven's Fist is is my favourite album. So the, the '60s influence of the band's early sound gained many fans. So let me share this 1984 quote from Jello Biafra, as told to Murray Englehart in Duke magazine. This could be the best Time Warp-style 60s garage revival I've ever heard. They seem to be more interested in recreating 60s garage mania than updating it. I never thought I'd hear a psychedelic slime band more hardcore than Green Fuzz, but here they are. So I guess he summed up that time period yes. quite accurately, I reckon. Yes, we are also described by American Rolling Stone as the Sex Pistols on Acid. So that sort of was a, I thought that was a pretty good description, actually, pretty yeah, apt. Because yeah. we were very much a hybrid of 70s punk, and 60s psychedelia, you know, like, um, I mean, the basic premise of the band, my idea to start with was simply um, embellish or, you know, do the 60s type groove with um, a louder, more uh, more modern rock and roll sound, you know, with, mm-hmm. you know, um, martial amps, etc. you know, like, and um, 
give it the um, treatment with some um, a solid rock, um, you know, body to it, and um, that's simply what we did. And um, a lot of bands were starting to do that, you know, and some people called it punk, and it wasn't really a lot of it wasn't a lot of it was exactly what we were doing. Mm. It was like um, 60s influenced pop that was revved up with um, louder amps and things, you know. <laughs> There's some people could play better than others, you know. In the mid-80s, the band gets signed to Virgin. Was there any label interest besides Virgin Records? Well, no, there was no bidding war or anything. In fact, we didn't exist at the time um, Virgin signed us. We hadn't played for early months. I was traveling. I was living in London and wasn't that interested in coming back. But this is all well, got, well documented in my book. I mean, it's quite a story in itself. It came about through... That was a, a real... A lucky, lucky, lucky chain of events actually, because Laurie Dunn, who became Australia's um, the head on show on Australia of Virgin, the um, you know, whatever the official position was, he was the main man at Virgin Australia. He had been involved. His um, independent label in London was Hybrid. Uh, he'd released Slave Girl as a six track, or the first. First two singles was a six-track um, compilation, 12-inch EP over there mm. on that label. So he was mad about the band from the start, from the early, the early stuff, and also happened to see us in the, in the studio recording with a, with a libido. Um, dropped into the studio, and well, that's when we first met him. Anyway, in the interim, while I was overseas traveling, he, Virgin, um, came to Australia and he got the job of head on show. So, us, though, I mean, the Divinals were the first three bands that were signed, you know, like, mm-hmm. um, he wanted, we were, we were on his hit list straight away because he, you know, he, he, we had a history, we had a history with him, you know. Well, I've, uh, that was I a found, connection. Okay. I found a quote from yourself, Mick, in a 1987 interview with Stuart Coop where you talk about the Virgin deal and state. We never wanted our band to be one of 50 bands and to not have very much personal control. With Virgin, it's quite the opposite. The contract we negotiated gives us virtually full artistic control, right down to artwork, photo sessions, and choice of material. So it sounds like signing with Virgin was you know, a smart move. Do you think they did enough to promote the band? And I'm mainly talking about an album like Beethoven's Fist, which we just mentioned. Well, certainly the first album was heavily promoted, you know, and yeah. um, The Cave Comes Alive. They spent a lot of money on us, actually. They spent, look, I won't go into figures, but they, they mm. spent a lot of money on us between recording, tour um, tour support, and um, films, or oh, well, videos, the cost of videos and so on. They certainly spent a lot of money on the band, but by the time they had an assist come along, there was a, there was a conundrum of um, problems. There was like the perfect storm of... The perfect storm of, you know, going down the gurgle or sort of thing with that. There was a um, combination of Virgin being sold Virgin being sold to EMI Music, so Richard Branson could concentrate on his airline for $585 million or thereabouts. Yeah. So our promotional budget was, was cut to some, you know, minimal, really, you know, not a lot, you know, uh, you know for a major national release and um, a lot of that was spent three weeks before the album was released um, he, this is what you get from um, idiots right I mean three weeks before the album was released a full page ad saying Lion Spider's new album by having fist out now in OW the album didn't, wasn't released until three weeks later so that sort of visionary stuff doesn't help <laughs> but I mean I can't complain like, like, we had a pretty good Free reign with them, um, and um, that was just that was just frustrating with that album because it could have done a lot, um, but it was it sort of sunk without a trace. Really, Triple J also went national at the time. Um, sack six of the or the sack six of the best DJs, including Tony Biggs and Gail Austin, etc. Mm. Um, and um, Danny Brennan, who had been the um, programmer at Triple Z who had banned Slave Girl became the programmer at Triple J and had never forgiven us for that song uh, being a hardcore feminist and um, absolutely um, 
wouldn't wouldn't play that album. But would refuse to play it. Uh, whereas Tony Biggs, I played it to him at a at a spare studio after he finished his shift. One one afternoon, I made a point of playing it to him after we got the um, mixes back from America. From um, it was mixed by Michael Brown in America. Mm. And he was just uh, knocked out by it, you know. It was just him and I just cranked it up, and he was just spent the whole time just shaking his head, you know, like in disbelief almost. Going, but but at the same time, going, I knew, I knew, Mick, I knew that one that one day you were going to, you know, it was going to happen, you know, this was going to happen, and he was just like absolutely blown out by it, and he tuned all the other DJs about it, mm. like a sack. The new regime decided it didn't fit into their format. Was the mm. official explanation I was given uh, before I hung up on Johnny Brennan that day, uh, when I, out of frustration, rang up the station myself and, and demanded an explanation. Um, and I was told um, that we didn't fit into their format. This is from a band that had made the um, Hot 100 of all time at Triple J, etc. And we're quite an iconic independent act, and yet they wouldn't support us. You know, so some things um, get stuck in my craw a bit. You know, I hope you've uh, written that in great detail in your book. It's a uh, fascinating story. Oh yes, I mean I, it's not a um, the book's not um, all about the good stuff. It's not all about you know, peaches and cream. It's you know, what's and all. It's Otherwise, it wouldn't be real, you know. Sure, it's, sure, sure. It um, it combines the good with the bad, you know, the good, mm. bad, and the ugly, <laughs> like you know, literally, you know. So, mate, end of 1987, the band do a tour of North America and Canada, supporting both Faith No More and Public Image Limited. Can you name a couple of highlights? Um, the College Music Seminar or Showcase gig was at um, College Music Showcase gig was at the Cat Club in New York, and. Um, Faith and more supported us, and uh, I never felt so out of my depth in my life. You know, it was the really? original Faith and more with Chuck okay. Mosley, the We Care a Lot days, and uh, they were just sensational. You know, like, and it was their home turf, and having to follow that was, uh, well, as I say, I never felt so out of my depth in my life. We made it to the Big Apple. A, we made it to the Big Apple. Um, my band from very humble beginnings had so made it to New York, and. Um, that obviously meant a lot. Then um, I'm standing in the crowd, in this hip crowd, watching Faith No More, going, what the hell am I doing here? You know, I just thought, how, how on earth are we going to follow this? It was just so good, you know, it was wonderful. And they finished the set with a blue string version of War Pigs, you know, the Black Sabbath song. Mm, okay. And uh, we did have to follow that. And to make matters worse, or, you know, to make my nerves worse, that was a night where... As we're in this uh, little closet of a dressing room before that, before our set, after seeing Faith No More, Iggy Pop and Jerry Moon just happened to pop in to say hello. So that was a, a daunting experience. And um, uh, when I say I felt out of my depth, I mean, yeah, I felt out of my depth. <laughs> I learned a lot that night. It was, it was um, a big turning point in a lot of ways. I also got to realise that people like Iggy Pop, Iggy, Iggy was great. He was a lovely guy, and and um, really, um, we just clicked him and I, uh, and talked about we talked about trout fishing. Actually, we didn't talk about music at all, and that's another story. But you know, like he was standing in the door, like he didn't walk past me. I was in the doorway, of this dressing room. He didn't walk past me. He actually stood opposite me, looking at me, and. You know, between his piercing eyes and accentuated by the mascara, he's like drilling me, you know, like I'm thinking, <laughs> God, well, you know, what? say something, Mick, you know, like, and I didn't want to blow it. I didn't want to blow the opportunity by, you know, doing the oh, love, you, love your music, sort of talking about the obvious stuff. And so mm -hmm. my mind was working out of time thinking, what am I going to say? And um, luckily I got a profile on his private life before I went to America um, from some magazine. And realised that he did a lot of fishing and camping in the woods with his son Sean, something you wouldn't ex yeah ex expect from Maggie Pop, you know, the last thing you'd expect, you know, the outdoors man, you know. And but I went there, I went, I went there, 
uh, you know, a light bulb moment and went there. I said, so Iggy, uh, the first thing I said to him was, I said, oh, g'day, Iggy, um, I hear you like fishing, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and he just lit up. He said, how do you know that, man? <laughs> I said, well, I'm a, I'm a fan of you. I'm a fan of you as a person, Iggy. And he just, he just lifted me. He, he just lifted me up above his shoulders and said, "I knew you'd be a dude, man." <laughs> <laughs> that was that was yeah. Um, I don't talk about that a lot because it's, it, it sounds unbelievable, but it's yeah, it actually happened. And um, I've also mentioned that in my book because it was certainly um, possibly not probably the highlight of my career. You know, like that moment. And then after all that, had to go and perform. And uh, so small wonder I don't remember any of it because I think I was so overwhelmed. Um, I just probably went into some sort of I don't know some sort of state of shock or something. <laughs> and then you, you uh, caught up with him. You did some shows with Iggy in '89 from memory. Yeah, well, the following year actually um, was it the following year. I oh, know it wasn't. Yes, I deny. And you're you're correct. He was, to, he was promoting the Instinct album, and um, had a great band. Actually, had pretty much the Hanoi, Hanoi Rocks band with him, mm-hmm. and um, we did the Horden and Newcastle Leagues, um, and um, yeah, he loved us. Yeah, he he, he um, it was just uh, he genuinely loved us, and there was no crap about it. You know, he he really liked our band. You know. Mate, whilst researching this interview, I'd forgot that uh, Weirdo Libido ended up on the Young Einstein film. Those kind of things can really push a band to the masses, can't they? Uh, you know, give a band more exposure. Was that inclusion beneficial, do you think? No, no publicity is bad publicity, as they say. Yeah, mm. it, couldn't, it, didn't, it didn't hurt. And, I, and I, it's, it's, a, it's a popular song, you know, amongst our fans. And um, this time around, we'll... We'll certainly be doing it, you know. Like uh, it's quite a well-known, popular song of ours through the film and so on. And it was a bit of a link in the chain because it was released as our first single with Virgin before the album came out, just because uh, it had already been recorded and they they got the rights for it and um, put that out as a first single mm. with Virgin. And um, it just kept the um, wheels turning. It was also the first song ever played on ABC's Rage, actually, that, which was celebrated this year. The 30th anniversary was celebrated, and I was interviewed by Wendy Harmer about that very point, that it was um, the very first song ever played on Rage, you know. So it was um, that was another feather in our cap. Yeah, well, it's quite an honour, I guess, considering the longevity of that program. Exactly, yeah. And it was nice to be remembered. It's, it's good they did the research and um, got their facts right about it, you know, because... Uh, these days, with uh, Wikipedia, etc., there's um, mm-hmm. lots of um, lots of mistruths out there and lots of misinformation. You know, that's why that's one of the reasons that you know I kind of what well I was putting off. People had been saying to me for years, oh, "You got to write a book, Nick. You got to write a book." Because I anybody that knew any you know my anecdotes from the days of the band, so many good ones. As, as you know. As, Kept telling me, I got you got to write a book, but um, you know the, the thought of it was just exhausting. You know, like where to start, even you know. Mm-hmm. And um, as I know, you know, it's a lot of work, and, and, and there's a long way to go yet. And you know, I'm 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 hoping that. Well, I, I know that when it's released, it'll be a good read in general. You know, not not just for people who are fans of the band or fans of music it's a good story it's a good it's a lot of good stories within it and um the, the whole stories from rags to riches kind of thing and a lot of those sort of themes that people like that, that are that are warm warm and fuzzy uh, feelings you know how far, um and how far along are you with the book well probably about 70 80 percent i'd say um but this, um, there's, yeah, you know, there's another chapter coming up. You know, I'm going to finish it with this. The last chapter, you know, hasn't hasn't been performed yet. You know, I'm going to finish it on a high with this uh, turn of events for this festival and so on, and um, have that as the final chapter. So hopefully, it'll be a happy ending. <laughs> 
touch wood. Well, mate, I just want to t- talk about Weirdo Libido, uh, one more point, oh. and then we'll, uh, move, we'll move on. So that single cracked the Sydney top 40 and went to 43 nationally. Did you ever pay much attention to the charts? I know that um, Slave Girl made the TWS top 40 technically at 37, um, based on just the first week okay. of sales. In reality, we were, you know, um, more of an independent act. And, I mean, with Virgin, don't I mean, and the vinyls were obviously the more commercial acts, and um, we kind of took a back seat to them as far as, um, I mean, having said that, there was a couple of songs of ours, like Jessica and The Other Side of You, two, two of my songs, which were, you know, really, really well recorded and produced and, um, you know, really had commercial success written all over them, but um, didn't get the guarantee, you know, they didn't get the airplay, you know. Some things are just out of your control, you know, you know, <laughs> got no control over that. Sure, so sure, sure. all you can do is put them out, you know, give it your best, put them out, and um, if it's a hit, it's a hit. If it's not, well, it doesn't matter, you know. <laughs> Back on show number 22, we had Phil Hall on the show and looked over the Beethoven's Fist record in great detail. Now, my brother reviewed it back in the day and correctly wrote, this record stands as one of the most complete rock and roll albums to come out of Australia in recent times. What are your memories of that time period? And we're going to play a track in a moment, um, in particular having Kevin Shirley produce that record. Do you know about Enemy's review of that album? No, I don't think I Enemy, New Musical Express? This was like... This is pretty important in the overall scheme of things. The impact we had with that album, um, the sort of reviews we were getting. NME, one of the toughest music presses in the world, in England, you know, they gave it a five star review, and the quote unquote review was simply the best Australian rock and roll album since the same song Stranded, five out of ten, or five stars, or whatever it was, you know, five stars, I think. Mm. And that was it, that was the review. That was as simple wow. as that. Wow. But yeah, you know, and um, I definitely get much better than that, you know. Like um, I can live with that, and yeah, very proud of that album. But you know, having said that, there's a lot of good tracks that didn't make that album. Apart from on his book, I've been unearthing all these unreleased songs, mainly demos, some for that album, some for other albums, some since that time, etc. Um, for an album of unreleased material that I'm going to get put out there. Um, possibly on vinyl only, like next year, and another album's worth of um, rarities, kind of B-sides and that type of thing. You know, compilation songs, rarities, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So I've got two albums worth of stuff coming up, and a lot of great songs that should have made it to that Bright Heaven's Fist album, actually. So what I'm saying is that, like, not even though it was a great album, there was actually it could have been a lot better because there was. There's better songs that, that that should have made that album actually, like, um, and we all concur with that. Yeah, we all agree with that. But uh, it's quite, you know, sacrilege that a couple of tracks in particular didn't make it. But um, they're finally going to see a lot of day with this album I'm putting out, and the album's going to be called LSD. I couldn't believe it. Like, um, with the line of spiders being LS, I'd never, over all these years, sort of the obvious, which is, yeah. LST, Lion Spiders mm. be something, you know, like mm. um, the connotation of the, the obvious connotation of acid. Mm. And um, so that, that's what this one's going to be called. <laughs> that'll, be, that'll be coming out next year at some stage, you know. Mick, I'd like to crank my favourite song from Beethoven's Fist, which is Real Thing. It's got your distinctive vocals, sharp guitars, to the point lyrics like, if you see me in a limousine, I'll be the guy behind the wheel. What's not to like? Can I get you to intro that with a little background, please? From memory, the first track off I'd have a fifth album, it was um, a lot of fun. Um, I, I pretty much rewrote the original lyrics weren't written by me. They were written by Chris Morrow, who was the other person involved in writing that song, with Phil Hall, our bass player. And, um, yeah, it's a pretty straight-ahead rock um, number, and um, I just had a lot of fun with those lyrics, basically, with... Um, pretty much going with everything I could think of that wasn't real. <laughs> Lifted from their album Beethoven's Fist, that is the Lime Spiders with the gutsy real thing. Love, love, love that. How much material from Beethoven's Fist is in the current set list? Um, not that much. Only a couple of songs, really. Not much high. Mm. And, um, oh, geez, I'm not sure. I don't think that might be the only song. There's not many songs off that Cherry album. Red. 
Uh, we may be doing that actually. We we haven't played that for years, but we did it recently at rehearsal, and it mm. came up all right. So we that might get a guarantee. Um, we've got cheers from obviously. So <laughs> we'll see how we go. So it sounds uh, our, our you know um, countdown to ecstasy is going to be in Sydney with our rehearsals there, mm. and we're going to have a lot more time to sort of work on stuff and um, just kind of see what comes up trumps. Now, I've seen you guys a bunch of times over the years, yet a couple of my favourite shows were, in fact, quite late uh, in the band's career, and they they occurred both on the same night, June 27th, 1992. The band did a Black Crows support at the Horden, and then we headed straight to the Crows Nest Hotel for your latest slot. Two gigs in one night. Um, bands, I remember, bands don't I remember do that, that anymore, I, do they? Well, two gigs and breaking up with your girlfriend on the same night, so I remember it very well. It was very emotional. It was an emotional roller coaster that night. I was, um, um, I was, um, I was in, t- I was in crocodile tears for a long time before the crow's nest gig. <laughs> I think it was a feathers at crow's nest or something, it was. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a, that was a hard week actually. We, we did the whole white crow's tour, uh, and the only night off we thought it was going to be a night off. But on the Thursday night, they, um, we managed to, uh, we got, got our support with the baby animals at State Theatre. So we played um, five shows with Black Crows, four or five shows with them, and and one with the um, with the Baby Animals. So it was it was a big week, you know. So playing two years in one night at the end of the week wasn't uh, real forgiving. <laughs> I look back on um, our schedule, you know, it was pretty grueling at times. I mean, writing a book, as I say, like I know more about the band now than I ever did, including. A ridiculous fact that we did um, on our first tour of Europe, we did um, had the same one of gigs. We did twelve in a row or eleven in a row, I think it was. Um, in Norway, the Roskilde Festival in Denmark, like a, a massive music festival on the Sunday. Then, um, like six nights in a row in Germany. So there was like. Mm. Um, but, yeah, a ridiculous schedule, you know. So it's small wonder I don't remember anything about that week in Germany. <laughs> so if anybody out there that does, let me know. So from memory... I've got a poster. <laughs> and I guess uh, I'm just getting sidetracked about your book. It's it's when you get time to sit down, write about it and look back, then the reality, I guess, or the enormity of, of what you're doing it becomes apparent. Maybe when you're 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 doing it and you're doing gig after gig after gig, you just roll with it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, you kind of um, you kind of feeding off adrenaline and um, just to keep it going more or less. And um, you know, a lot of it schedule back then. When you're a headline act, you know, a headline touring act. You um wouldn't play. You would you wouldn't be playing until midnight or later, and mm. that type of thing. You know, so a lot of it was just exhausting, absolutely, absolutely exhausting. And when you did have a spare time, um, when we were busy, you know, like I had my, my my um my lady, my fiance actually, um, and I spent as much time as possible with her, and um, certainly wouldn't be thinking about writing a book. Mm. Um, so it's very much in retrospect now, but it, it, it's good that we're actually getting back together, back on the horse to, um, to, um, to do it again because it's, it's sounding better than ever. And, um, I know, I know it will be, I've got a lot more perspective on the whole thing now mm. is, is, is what it's all about is, and I'll appreciate it more. I'm sure, you know, it, it uh, now that I've had time to sort of deal with my health issues and um, get more philosophical about life in general, I guess. Mm. And um, mm. I'm not looking back in anger, you know. <laughs> I look back, uh, I'm very proud of what we've achieved, you know. And um, um, the fact that, you know, like, we're better known overseas than we are here in our own country. That's and that's, the, that's the fact, you know. Like, these Spanish people are absolutely mad about us, you know. Um, I've been hearing this for about 30 years. It's going to be very exciting playing over there, you know. Like, um, I'm not that interested in playing many shows here in Australia, but I'd be quite. When the church, for instance, they're, 
they um, they play overseas. They tour Europe and America quite a lot still, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, they're still really big over there on a regular basis. That, yeah, they, they put out a new album this year and um, recently did a tour of America. And um, Ian, who's been proud, I think, of Ian how he's now in the church and has been for three or four years now. And he was telling me about it. So Australia's not the beer on end all is what I'm saying as far as mm-hmm. our future. As far as our future is concerned, I think our future lies overseas. Um, so going to make every poster winner with this festival and knock them dead and um, so, that, so that they'll be, um, you know, have us back next year for a, a more full-scale tour. You definitely did knock them dead on that night I mentioned in 92 with the two gigs on the one night. So the, the Robinson brothers, Chris and Rich from the, the Black Crows, had they seen the band do a gig in the US and a friendship was struck? How did that work? Uh, we didn't meet them then, but that's how we got the gig because they saw us when we toured the States in back in 87, they, they'd seen us back then and they hadn't forgotten us. And so when they, five years later, when they come to Australia, they specifically asked if we were still still around kind of thing. That's how we got the gig, you know. They um, So that was a another um, example of what I'm talking about, about the level of respect we've had overseas, more so than here, really, you know. Like, um, we've had a... Um, yeah, a degree of respect here, but the music scene in Australia is a bit hard to, a bit hard to um, crack the nut because um, it, it's a whole different beast, you know. Like it's very, it's being very commercial driven here. It, it, this is the, the size of the population; it's not big enough to support anything that's not commercial, and you know. Sure, sure. Um, so we still spend fed. Yeah, Barnsley, etc. You know, it's um, that's what a lot of people like, and uh, that's Australia for you, mate. Let me ask you a tough one, and I know I ask this question in in many of my interviews, but with the beauty of hindsight, looking over your thirty seven year career, would you have done anything different with the Lime Spiders? Uh, uh yes, but I won't go into details. But you can't think of you know, it's life in general. You can't, reg- yeah, like life's what it what to make of it and mm, um, mm. Um, sure in retrospect I would have made, I'd done things differently but that's not to say that would have worked either sure, you know like sure. um, uh, I mean you just can't think about life like that I think you've just got to be take it as it comes and make the most of what you've got at the time and um, hopefully make the right decisions and plan things well you know it's, it's all about that type of thing you know well, and see. if things don't work well it's, it, like for instance with this upcoming festival, I know that I left no stone unturned with attention to detail, etc. cetera. So, uh, and I know that we're going to deliver the goods musically. There's no reason why it won't work. You know, like, the, um, I, I can't see any, anything to worry about. So, going there full of confidence, which will be great. You know, like, we've done the, uh, especially by the time we've done this warm-up show in Sydney, we'll have done the, all the hard yards and, um, uh, attention to detail with the set list, etc., and rehearsals, and you name it, and um, with promotion, etc. Having that gig under our belt will be good, though, because it'll be, yeah, you know, uh, I'm sure that Maryville Bowling Club show will be um, a big success. And we've it's sold you know, over half the tickets already, and we're still, mm. still a couple of weeks out, so I'm sure it'll be a sellout and a great atmosphere, so it'll be great send off for us to have that under our belt in our old in my old hometown of Sydney um, before we leave uh, to conquer America uh, conquer Spain you know um, is there any chance Spanish conquest of, um, <laughs> is there any chance that this uh, current line- lineup of the band w- will get into the studio is there any chance really because Danny the guitarist that's what we we actually rehearsed in his studio he runs the studio down um, where he lives just outside of Bega, a place called Wallagoot, um, Pirate Studios. So, yeah, I mean, that, that'll be the place to do it, and there's no reason why um, we shouldn't. But in the yeah, in the meantime, as I say, I've got these um, two albums worth of, of material to be released um, in the next year. Um, mm. I'm, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking probably um, 
staging them, you know, releasing them a, a, a couple of months apart or whatever, you know. Like, sure, um, sure, sure. And um, there's a long way to go with that yet as well, but there's certainly lot, lots of things in the planning. It's not like um, this isn't just a one-off reformation kind of thing. You know, we're, 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 we're back. We're back. Um, we're back. Oh, for good, pretty much. We're, we're back well, to. Sounds, um, it sounds positive. You know, to, to, yeah, we're, we're back to um, to make it work, um, and probably got a bit of a B in our bite as far as wanting to prove once and for all that you know we're the real deal. <laughs> Mate, uh, we're going to close out with your live take of Eric Burden and the Animals when I was young, which I've always dug. Did you ever do a studio take okay. of that song? No, we've only got that um, ABC. Uh, we did it live on ABC um, TV on blah, blah, blah. I think it was, I think yeah. it was a show, Edward yeah. Hinton's program. And a lot of people like that, actually. A lot of people really like that version. Mate, every guest on the show gets to select a song by an Australian band that has a meaning for you. Can be one of yours. Is there something you'd like to choose and why? Um, well, I'd like to choose the Zoots, on, the Zoots version of Honor Rigby because it was the first single I ever bought. Um, and it's a, it's a fantastic, fantastic um, interpretation of a great song. Or, Honor Rigby done very differently with a, sort of a rock, for, pretty much a rock version of it. And that band included um, some pretty um, guys that went on to become pretty big names, you know, mm, mm. Um, beyond Zoo. And, yeah, Rick Springfield, Dole Cotton, etc. B. Bertles. Yep. B. Bertles joined the River Band. So they're a bit of a uh, super group. And um, I saw them do it live on Happening 70. I think it was the same mm-hmm. age here, you know. But I was young then. But no, just a, a, a great track. It, um, right. it still rocks. It really sounds great. It hasn't dated, you know. Thanks for coming on the show today, mate. Very cool to talk with you. Good luck with the upcoming shows and keep in touch. Keep Thanks, in touch. Dennis. See you, mate. Cheers.